Hello everybody, this is CJ Wiley with some adventures on the road after dark. I got a question uh, a couple days ago when I started dreaming of like being a world champion pool player. And the uh, answer is, I don't think I really did for quite a while. My whole goal was to just be better than everybody else. So it started out in the small pool room that I grew up going to called uh, Clayton's Pool Room in Green City, Missouri. Population of 629. He had a little pool room that had three pool tables, all different colored cloth. The first one was red and the next one was green and then the last one was blue. I think they might have switched that a time or two, but those were the colors that I remember. And then in the back of the room, there was a wood-burning fireplace, like a uh, you put logs in. On Saturday mornings, I would walk to school a lot of times through the snow, probably about a mile, I guess, and uh, I'd get there at like 7.30 in the morning or 8 in the morning, and sometimes it was right when Oren was getting there, so I would help him uh, bring in some wood and the pool room would be ice cold, so the pool balls would be cold. I don't know if you've played with cold pool balls, but they don't react very well. <laughs> so when you play them, they're kind of dead. And uh, I remember, you know, while that fire was warming up, the uh, I would be practicing. <clears throat> and the balls just, it wouldn't be much fun for a little while. And, uh, and then they would eventually warm up pool was a dime a game there, only if you lost, so we were kind of gambling on every game, because if you lost, you owed a dime. A lot of times I'd go to that little pool room and play all day, and not spend any money on pool. I'd win every game all day. <laughs> so, I started when I was seven, but when I was nine, I ran uh, two racks of eight ball on a nine-foot table in a row, and then when I was twelve... I remember was the first time I broke and ran all 15 balls in order. We called the game rotation. And uh, so nine ball and eight ball, or nine ball and 10 ball are also rotation games, but this is with the full 15 balls. This is what they play in the Philippines and why Efren Reyes and some of those players are, uh, are so good. Like I grew up playing rotation and eight ball, and that's like a perfect uh, combination. I kind of wish I would have played uh, straight pool growing up, but I never did, and I just really never uh, developed a, a real passion for competing at the game, even though I did play in one professional tournament and ended up getting second. I beat Efren Reyes on the winner's side, and then uh, he came back and beat me in the finals. But that was the only straight pool play, uh, tournament that I ever played because we just didn't I didn't even know about that game growing up. So, after Oren's, uh, you know, Oren Cleeton's pool room, I started going to Kirksville, Missouri, which was about 20 miles away, and uh, would play at a bowling alley called Leisure World, and at a uh, place that was a pro bass shop, or bass pro shop, <laughs> whichever. I think the, uh, the guy that owned it was related to the uh, uh, the chain, the guy that started the chain of uh, pro bass shops. I get that mixed up sometimes. Bass pro, pro bass. And the reason is because his was the opposite of the chain. <laughs> so it's a little confusing. But this little place had like fishing and hunting uh, gear to buy in the front of the building and then as you went down the middle area was a little pool room that had uh, three nine foot tables it had a billiard table and uh, I think it had a smaller table there let me see no just a billiard table and three nine foot tables so it's a small place and then the other part of it which was smaller was an archery range so uh, they sold uh, fishing and hunting gear, including the uh, archery equipment. And then they had where you could join their club, I guess. And there were people back there uh, shooting arrows and 
and which I like to do too. I've, I've been an archer. I, as a matter of fact, I've got a bear compound bow right now. And as a lot of you know, Zen and the Art of Archery was one of my favorite pool books, which I've read six or seven times. And uh, always get more wisdom out of that book. That's a classic and easy to compare to pool. So when I started going to Kirksville, Missouri, uh, that's where I played Leisure World and, and that uh, Bass Pro Shop. I met a few gamblers there. There was a guy named Max, who was just a funny guy. He used to uh, have all these little sayings and stuff, and he'd get mad and MF uh, children's toys and small towns in West Texas is what he used to like to say. <laughs> and uh, he had a lot of little uh, one-liners that uh, kept you kept you laughing. You know, that's what I like about the pool rooms. You know, lots of one-liners and. A lot of pool players are just naturally pretty funny. Max and I used to go late at night to the 7-Eleven and gamble playing pinball. He was a good pinball player, and he actually used to spot me. And we would gamble and sometimes, you know, win or lose like $100, which when you're, uh, you know, 15 or 16 years old, that's quite a bit of money. But we used to play like almost like all night, and uh, we played so good we didn't have to keep money, you know, in the machine because you'd run up credits. So anyway, that's where I started getting seasoned gambling. And then I was out at Leisure World one night and they told me that there was a big time pool player in town from Columbia, Missouri, which was about uh, 90 miles south of Kirksville, which is a much bigger city, has a major college, and uh, which Kirksville had Northeast Missouri State University. But now the name is uh, Truman College. So it was a, a fairly big uh, uh, city. But uh, at Leisure World that night, Tom Draper was there from Columbia. And he was looking to gamble playing pool because he played pretty well. And he didn't figure anybody in Kirksville in that little bowling alley could beat him. So they came and got me. And uh, at that time, I was 16 and I, you know, nobody would gamble with me playing pool, so it kind of surprised me and I couldn't wait to, to play him. He wanted to play nine ball and I told him that I didn't play nine ball, that I played rotation, but eight ball was the game that I uh, played most, so he agreed to play eight ball with me. Well, that didn't go so well for him because I beat him like three games in a row and uh, then I agreed to play nine ball, and I had him explain the rules to me, which he, he thought I was kind of hustling him, but I wasn't. I, I really didn't know exactly how to play the game, even though it was the same as rotation as far as shooting him in numeric order, one through the nine. So in that respect, it was the same. So he explained the rules to me. I break the balls and run all the balls on the table in order. <laughs> and he, he got mad. He, he got like... Uh, his face got red and everything, and he, he accused me of hustling him. So anyway, after he cooled down a little bit, uh, I told him, I, you know, I didn't want to win his money, but I was real curious about Columbia, Missouri, because I know there were some really good players there, and I thought it would be cool to take a little road trip there. So, uh, you know, I said I was 16. I got to make a correction here. I was 15, because... Tom told me all about uh, Columbia, Missouri, and that I should come there and gamble. And he would, like, steer me around and tell me who to play. The reason I say I'm 15 at that time is because I went to my friend that I was staying with, John Emmerich, who had a little Mazda, yellow Mazda car. And I asked him if I could borrow his car and go to Columbia. And I remember I didn't have a driver's license, so he let me use his car to drive 90 miles away to Columbia, Missouri, to the Columbia Billiard, uh, what, what was it called? Columbia Billiard Center on 9th Street. The only stipulation he said was, you wreck, you pay. And I had a real successful snow cone business, so I had uh, plenty of money to cover the cost of his car in case I totaled it. And he knew that. So uh, it was a pretty safe bet for him, but, but he still went out on a limb to let a 15-year-old kid borrow his car. <laughs> but 
But I did, and I drove all the way to Columbia, Missouri, and I went in, and I ended up playing a guy named Keith, and uh, we played nine ball for 20 a game, and I ended up beating him out of, uh, I think about $80, maybe 100 and uh, he quit and said he needed weight. And I said, wait, what is that? And he said, uh, you got to know what weight is. Again, he's accusing me of hustling him. But I'm from a small town. I haven't heard all this terminology yet. So he said, weight is a handicap. It's like you have to give me some weight, meaning you have to give me a handicap. Like in golf, there's a handicap. And in pool, he said, it would be fair if you gave me the seven and the eight, which means he would win on the seven, eight, and nine, and I only win on the nine. But in nine ball, you can make combinations, so you can hit the three into the nine, and you win the game. Or with that handicap, he could, he could hit the three into the eight and win, or the three into the seven and win. So it's a pretty significant handicap. Unless you play so well, you just never miss, and then it doesn't really matter <laughs> so much. But at that time, it did. And I ended up, for hours, uh, staying ahead of him. But then all of a sudden, he started making it on the break and making combinations, and he quickly turned it around. And I think he won his money back, and I quit. So basically broke even, and I learned a lesson. I learned what weight was, and I learned that it did matter. So... Um, Another person I met at Columbia Billiard Center after uh, I played Keith, really it was during uh, playing Keith, was Craig Bickford. Now Craig was a young kid, really sharp, played cards and dice and played pool really well. He didn't play as good as I did. He played about the seven ball under me. I would give him the seven and it was pretty close at that time. So he played really well. And, uh, and he was sharp. I mean, he was a real little hustler boy. He wasn't a real big guy, but he had long hair, and he's real good looking, and uh, the, the girls really liked him. So uh, he drove a 280ZX, silver color. Uh, so we went on road trips together in that 280ZX, and one of the places that we really loved to go with it was Evansville, Indiana. The reason was they had a uh, pool room, Arc Lanes. It was at a, uh, it was like a bowling alley, but they had a, it was a nice pool room area. So they played there on the bigger tables, but then they had several bars in town they played. But the favorite place with us was called the Busy Body. The Busy Body Lounge was a strip club, and it was just a real small little brick building, just a white, dingy building on the outside. And uh, you walked in, and I mean, it was just, they kept it pretty dark, and then they had uh, three stages where the girls danced, and then in the back, they had a small bar table. Now, the reason that this bar was so successful is Evansville is pretty close to the, uh, the racetrack on the other side in Kentucky. So, a lot of times, jockeys would come over and uh, hang out at that strip club. And they had a lot of money, and they liked to gamble. So uh, one night I was at the Busybody, and I had uh, been drinking a little bit. We were all partying, and I uh, got to play in this jockey, little jockey, <laughs> some pool. And I beat him pretty quick. Well, then he came back, and he said, uh, you want to flip a coin for $100? So I, uh, I said yes. So he made me flip it and me call it. And I flipped and I lost. And then I called it again and I won. And then I lost. And then I lost again. And this old time hustler named Bob came up behind me. And he whispered in my ear, keep calling heads. And he palmed me a coin. <clears throat> Well, I knew what that meant. I didn't have to look at it. So I kept telling the guy, here, you flip it. He goes, nope, you got to flip it. You got to call it. So I said, I kept calling heads. Well, obviously, it came up heads every time. <laughs> and looking back, I was like, you know, I had the nerve to do that, but I was drinking and, you know, it was caught up in the moment. And I also had another coin in my hand in case uh, something happened. I was going to switch them out. So anyway, I ended up beating him out of uh, all his money, which was like 800 
a gold necklace and uh, his car. He gave me the title to his car. So the agreement was he got it the next day for $500, I think is what it was. Uh, it was either 500 or 1000 I can't remember exactly. But when I woke up the next morning, I went out and got a soda. Went back to the room and uh, no big deal. Well, there's a knock on the door about 15 minutes later and it's Bob. Now he wants his end of the money and uh, wants his coin back. So I said, sure, I'll give you your coin back. So I got in my pocket, I looked at it. I didn't have the coin. And then it hit me. I put it in the pop machine, <laughs> in the soda machine. And I told him that. And at first he didn't believe me and he started getting uh, irritated. He was like, you know, that's a ha handcrafted coin I got in New Orleans. It's perfectly balanced. And I was like, well, if it's perfectly balanced, then... Uh, it would fit in a pop machine and it would it would work, right? And he said yes. So <laughs> there you go. He went to the office and they said that uh, the guy that got the change out of the machine was actually coming that day, later on in the afternoon. So he waited till three o'clock and met the guy there and went through all the quarters and found his quarter. <laughs> so. And I ended up meeting up with the jockey and giving him his car title back and uh, getting. Uh, money. Again, I can't remember exactly what it was. I think it was, I think it was 500, but, uh, but what an ordeal that was. And, uh, so the busybody was a favorite place for Craig Bigford and, and I, and we won a lot of money there. We ended up being friends with about five of the strippers that were regulars. And we made a deal with them that if they steered one of their customers to us and we beat them out of any money, they got 20%. So when news, you know, when that word uh, spread, it was like built in action because these girls would sit over there with these guys and, and point over at the pool table and tell them that they love to watch guys play pool and how sexy it was. And, and then they'd say, look at those kids over there. They've been losing money. And uh, they think, you know, maybe they're drug dealers or something. And because that's what we wanted them to think because that's who we usually targeted. It was like drug dealers, bookies, pimps, uh, bookmakers, uh, underworld activity people because they had the most cash money. So the Busybody Lounge was a favorite for Craig and I and uh, another player I traveled with, Rusty Brandemeyer, and I went there several times. So uh, now he never did anything with the women because he was married and I... I know he didn't because I always admired that, but Craig and I did, and we had a signal that if we were with somebody in the hotel room and the other one came up, we put a Mountain Dew can on the outside of the door, and that was the signal, like a do not disturb. So then we would go to our car, and then occasionally we'd go look, and if the Mountain Dew can was gone, then we were free to go come in the door and everything was good. Everybody was covered up <laughs> and uh, all was well. So anyway, Evansville, Indiana and uh, Craig Bickford and I had a heck of a time there. Now one other thing that comes to mind uh, with Craig and I was the first time I saw like a, a mass uh, hypnotist effect put on people. I'd actually seen it before with this same technique, but I'd never done it before. We were down at a uh, town in Kentucky that was just, it was about 40 or 50 miles south of uh, Evansville. And we went in this little pool room and we won some money and then we left for a while. And then we ended up coming back that night when all the big action was supposed to be happening. Well, they thought we were pool hustlers and you know, they were real leery of us. So Craig and I already had it prearranged that we told them, you think we care about money? We don't need the best of it. We got money to burn. And Craig took a hundred dollar bill and lit it on fire and showed everybody that hundred dollars. And everybody in the room, their eyes were glued to that hundred dollar bill burning up. And after that, it put like a spell on the room. And they got up and played us and we won like another 1500 and uh, 
you know, we make them laugh, and I mean, we're partying with them and everything, but once we burned that money, they knew we we proved we didn't really care about money, and it worked, and we won, uh, we won that and left and, and uh, was invited back. Not to play, though. They made a stipulation that uh, you can come back, but we're not going to play pool with you. We'll just have a few beers. Anyway, this is C.J. Wiley. If you like my stories and want to learn more about my systems, techniques, and fundamentals that I use to become the ESPN World Champion and voted one of the top three uh, money players of the 20th century with Efren Reyes and Earl Strickland, join me at MasteringPocketBillards.com, and I'll show you uh, how to play like the pros play. Anyway, until next time, this is C.J. Talk with you soon.